enthalpy. Okay, so guys, here we go. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to dig a little bit deeper, obviously, into chapter five, and we are going to talk about the first law of thermochemistry. Again, if you want to have sort of a disturbing experience, Google this. Your brain will explode. You have no idea how complicated the first law of thermochemistry can be. So guys, what you're going to have to do is trust me to teach it to you in the way that you need to wrap your head around this relative to the material that, um, that you're going to be held accountable for in AP. And guys, you're welcome to look it up. You're welcome to mucky muck with it if you want to. But guys, understand that the first law of thermo can be looked at from so many different angles, depending on what you're trying to do with it, that it can quickly become muddled. So guys, the way today is going to go is this. We're going to start by reviewing, and we're basically going to replay that conversation that we had in summary with that little block of brass and make sure that you understand all of the dynamics of internal energy work and heat. Then, guys, when we're done with that, we're actually going to start focusing not just on this generic idea that energy can go in and out, but how it goes in and out, work and heat, and then what that does to the system and surroundings mathematically and energetically, and that's called the first law of thermo. Then what we're going to do is we're going to start doing math with this, and we'll talk uh, at first sort of generically about how the math works. And then we're going to wrap up the day to day talking about what are called thermochemical equations, where you will actually be figuring out how much energy is lost or gained when chemical reactions take place. So it's a pretty big day. So guys, join me. Uh, we're going to start again by reviewing. Feel free to write down any of this that doesn't make sense to you right now with the understanding that this is all review. Okay, so guys, when we talk about everything that we learned last time, we learned this. We learned that there is a thing called the system. Now guys, what is the system? It's up to you, right? It's whatever it is that you're studying, but what did we talk about when we talked about picking a system? Say it again. Make it as simple as you possibly can. But guys, when we say simple, it doesn't mean not detailed. Because remember what we ran into with that little metal block? Initially, we said, hey, here's the system. But then when I ask you, does it have kinetic energy? I think Jake mentioned the idea that it really could have kinetic energy even when it's not moving because the molecules, the atoms, were moving inside the system. So at that point, we needed to say the system is not just the block. Well, it's the block, but we're not considering the atoms that make it up. Do you remember that? Okay, so guys, once we've picked the system, what did we also then pick by default? The surroundings, because everything that ain't the system is the surroundings. Now, guys, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. So then we started to talk about energy as it relates to the system and the surroundings. And the first thing we said is this. There's kinetic energy, the energy of motion. There's potential energy, which some of you were interested to find out is actually the energy of position. Potential energy is always stored relative to position and attraction. And guys, what did we then call the sum of potential and kinetic energy? internal energy, and we found out that kinetic can become potential and vice versa. These can interconvert, and guys, when they interconvert, what happens to the total internal energy of the system? Doesn't change. So these can interchange um, freely, and it doesn't change the energy of the system. So then the question became, how do we change the energy of the system? And that's where we talked about work and heat. You guys good? Questions or things you want to talk about there? Okay, so guys, let's summarize. If you want to write these things down, you're certainly welcome to. So guys, thought number one is this. Energy within a system can convert from potential and kinetic and vice versa with no change in internal energy. Good? Okay, thought number two, energy can be transferred between a system and its surroundings in the form of work and heat, and that is the only way to get energy in and out of a system is through the vehicle of work and heat. You good? We're good? All right. So guys, 
if you're sold on those ideas, we now need to start talking about the accounting. And this is where you want to start taking notes. So guys, the idea is this. When energy interconverts, when energy is exchanged, there's an important guiding principle that you need to understand, and it's called the first law of thermodynamics. Guys, okay, some of you are going to have a little ringing in your ears when you write down the definition of the first law of thermodynamics. It simply says this, it says that energy is neither created nor destroyed when changing forms or transferring between its system and surroundings. Sounds really familiar, right? What's it sound like? Law of conservation of mass. that says matter is never created or destroyed during chemical processes. Guys, it, this is so much like the law of conservation of mass that many people actually call the first law of thermodynamics the law of conservation of energy. Guys, energy is conserved. Now guys, with the, oh, you're still writing, Never mind. Are you good? Almost. How about now? You guys okay? Okay. So guys, let's make sure that you're clear on this then. So we understand that energy is never created or destroyed. That means it's conserved, but it's conserved when changing forms. So let's make sure you're clear. What are those two forms of energy? Kinetic and potential. So if that doesn't make sense or doesn't ring true, this is kinetic energy and potential energy. So we understand that when those interconvert, energy is not lost. Now it also talks about this idea of transfer. So guys, let's bring this all together. What are the two avenues for transfer? Work and heat. Work is abbreviated W and heat is abbreviated Q. So guys, the first law of thermo basically sums up the accounting of everything we talked about last time. So energy in has got to equal energy out and energy in or converted, potential up, kinetic down, vice versa, by the same amount. Energy is never lost, energy is never gained. The amount of energy that we have available to us is the same and always has been, just like mass. You get the idea? You're all right, you're sure? Okay, so guys, with that then as our guiding principle, what we need to do now is we need to start actually figuring out how these different interchanges work sort of mathematically. So guys, what we've got to do is this. We've got to consider, and this is a little review, but let's make sure we're clear. We've got to consider all the energy content of a system. And when we talk about all the energy content of the system, guys, as you already know, we are talking about what we call internal energy. So let's make sure we're clear. So guys, internal energy is abbreviated E. And E is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energy in a system, and therefore we can represent it mathematically like this. E, total internal energy, is equal to the sum of the kinetic and potential energy of a system. Uh, sigma, yeah, yep. It's the yeah. It's this dude. Yeah, it's that. Okay. So guys, are y'all caught up with me? Because we need to take a little station break here. You're okay. 
Okay, I don't know if you need to open your books to have this conversation with me, but if you would like to, it's not a horrible idea. Um, I don't know yet. Yeah, that's not this. Um, there it is. 168. Okay. So guys, when you did your four quadrant thing with chapter five, my suspicion, looking at page 168, is that when you got to the bottom of 168 after looking at all these pictures and diagrams, you ran into that word state function. And it was probably very attractive because of course it's bolded and by now you've been trained that bold means important, right? Okay. So you wrote down the word state function and my suspicion is that you wrote down state function in that lower right hand or lower left hand corner that was questions. What on earth is a state function? So guys, here's the deal. <laughs> We're not gonna talk about it, okay? This has been my experience. We could spend the better part of an hour doing a super deep dive on state functions. Most of you would feel like you understood it at the end of that hour long conversation. But as you then tried to apply the concept of state functions to, to the things that we're going to get into in this class, you would quickly find out that you actually didn't understand it. We will then spend additional time trying to unpack it and help you apply it in all these diverse situations. And guys, the bottom line is it doesn't matter. Now here's the problem. If you looked a physics professor in the eye and said state functions don't matter, they will hit you square in the face. Like guys, state functions are this huge critical concept. It's very, 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 very important, just not to us. And so guys, this is something that we are going to skip. If you see it on the AP test, it's gonna be one multiple choice question. Guys, we are going to skip state functions. Understand, it's not because it isn't important, it's because it isn't important to us. And the re and so frankly, I probably could have just skipped it and said nothing and you wouldn't have known the difference, except for this. Guys, here's how this applies. So we understand right now that internal energy is the sum of all the kinetic and potential energy for a system. Does that make sense? Add up the kinetic and potential and you end up with the, the energy of the system. So guys, let's go back to our metal block. How much energy does this block have? How could we measure it? The answer is we can't. Guys, you cannot directly measure energy, which is actually the next point in the notes. Guys, the problem is this. When we study energy, we cannot empirically talk about how much energy a system has. And do you remember that empirical does not mean simplified? We learned it when we talked about empirical formulas, right? But we talked about the bigger definition. What does empirical mean? Experimentally determined. Guys, there is no such thing as an energy meter. You cannot directly measure energy. The reason that you can't ties back into state functions and whether or not internal energy is a state function. And I'm not even gonna say it out loud because the minute we talk about whether or not internal energy is a state function, then questions pop up and you're going, oh my goodness. So guys, the bottom line is this. We can't directly measure energy. We do not have an energy meter. There's no way for us to measure energy. But guys, here's the deal. You can tell when the system has more energy. State one, I'm not even gonna use state one. Condition one, condition two. Which one's got more energy? How do you know? It's higher. 
But guys, the point here is you're not measuring energy, you're, me you're measuring altitude. Or what about this? What if I handed you this block and allowed you to feel it, and then I rubbed it a lot, and then handed it back to you? How would it be different? It's gonna be warm, right? Because I've rubbed it, friction causes heat and transfer, and you end up with more energy. But again, guys, you would know that it has more energy the second time, not because you've measured energy, but because you've measured temperature. Do you understand the idea? So there is no direct way to measure energy, but that doesn't matter to us because what we can do is we can measure energy changes. And we do that by measuring things like temperature for kinetic energy or changes in position like altitude for potential energy. So guys, here's where we are. You're going, whoa, he just gave us a bunch of these weird don't worry about sort of things and what do I really need to know? Guys, you really don't even need to know that we can't measure internal energy. The thing that you've got to be comfortable with is that when we measure energy, what we actually measure are changes in energy and we do that through secondary measurements like measuring temperature and measuring things like altitude and things like that. So energy is not measured directly, it's measured through change. Is that okay? Okay, so now let's talk a little bit more about change. Guys, this is the way we will quantify energy. You know, delta means change, right? So change in energy, just like, you guys, do you know this? That anytime you're measuring a change, it's final minus initial. So guys, when we are measuring the amount of energy that a system has gained and lost, it'll always be energy final minus energy initial. But now you're going, wait a minute. I thought that he said that we couldn't measure energy, so how can we measure it finally and initially? And guys, again, the idea is we won't directly measure it. We will measure actually uh, the secondary indications of it, like temperature and things like that, temperature change. But we need to understand that what we're actually measuring is changes in energy. And when we talk about that, we can then say this. If the final energy is greater than the initial energy, then the change in energy is positive. That's right. So if final is bigger than initial, a big number minus a small number is a positive value. So change in energy is positive. Then if the final energy is smaller, now you've got small minus big, and that gives you a negative value. How you doing? Is that a little mucky? Guys, and I know it probably feels mucky. You just got to trust me with the muckiness. If you walked out of that conversation and went, well, that's a little muddy, it's really okay. I mean, frankly, every year I think about just deleting this slide, but I always feel like I'm sort of doing you guys an injustice if I just skip that thought, because I think you're capable of being comfortable with mucky, but understand you probably don't experience mucky that often because you guys are smart and you all have good teachers that don't leave you in mucky. We actually do a good job of bringing you to understanding, but guys, just be comfortable with mucky. Go ahead, Trace. Oh, you're okay? Okay. So we, 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 we're, we're not good, we're mucky, but mucky is good. <laughs> Are we okay? All right. So now, guys, let's bring this full circle and let's really talk about where we're headed. And it's this. Guys, this entire day now is going to be about the transfer of energy. So how does it connect to what we just talked about? Well, guys, transferring energy causes energy to change, right? Oh yeah, yeah, so not inner converting, but transferring. Let me show you what I mean. So guys, check this out. This is the idea. So we understand this, that energy can inner convert. Kinetic can become potential and vice versa, and that doesn't change energy. 
That's not what we're talking about. Now we're talking about changing energy, right? We said that change of energy is equal to energy final minus energy initial. And interconverting between kinetic and potential doesn't change energy. So this is not the conversation related to the previous slide. That interchange doesn't change energy. So how do we change energy? work and heat. And that's how these pieces connect together. So guys, energy is affected by work and heat. So now maybe I can dig you out of the muckiness just a little bit. So let me do this by asking you questions. Can we measure, oh gosh, sorry, hold on, let me go up. Can we Can we measure energy? No, we can't, right? So what we can measure is, I gotta stop drawing with my finger, this is killing me. Okay, so can we measure energy? No. Can we measure delta energy? Yes. And how do we do it? Well guys, what causes a change in energy? Heat and work, and those things we can measure. Because guys, when we heat something or cool it, its temperature changes. And when we work on something, its position changes. Remember, work is force over distance. So guys, we don't directly measure energy. What we do measure is exchange of heat, because that causes a change in temperature, or work, which causes a change in position. And by measuring changes in temperature and changes in position, we can then go backwards and figure out how much the energy's changed, because work and heat affect energy. You get the idea? That's the way we get around that hurdle. Okay, so guys, now that we understand that work and heat's gonna be really important to us because that's what changes energy, let's bring this full circle then. So guys, changing energy, while it is final and initial, those final and initial conditions are determined by how much work and heat has been, been exchanged with the system. So guys, we're gonna say that change in energy is actually a function of the work and the heat that's been exchanged with the system. So now let's do this visually. You ready? Here's the system. What's everything else? The surroundings. How does energy get between the system and the surroundings? Work and heat. But now guys, and you may want to write this one down. Now we're going with two arrows. And you're about to learn something very important. I would actually, this is important enough you should write this down. Yeah, make it small, but yeah. This is worth doing. And guys, let me, let me just tee this ball up for you. If you've taken physics at any level, this is the moment when we are going to depart from what you learned in physics. We're not going to contradict what you learned in physics. What we are going to do is change your point of reference. You guys all caught up with me? Okay. So let me just ask you off the record. How many of you are so tightly bound to your understandings of system and work from physics that it would be helpful for you to do a deep dive on how chemistry teaches it differently? So you guys walked out of your physics classes not really connected with system and surroundings and it's not really gonna matter? Okay, so then let me just talk about this from a chemical standpoint. So guys, here's the deal. We understand that work and heat are the ways that we can get energy between the surroundings and the system. Now, in chemistry, there is a fundamental principle that you've got to understand, and that's frame of reference. So guys, in chemistry, this is always the case. You are in the system. As an aside, in physics, it's the opposite. In physics, the understanding is, is your point of reference is the surroundings. Now, in chemistry, it's the opposite. We will always be in the system. So now you're going, what on earth does that mean? Well, guys, the reason that it's important to understand that is because it changes the signs when you do the math of all the energy exchanges through work and heat that we're gonna do. So guys, notice what we've got. We've got two exchanges going 
out and we've got two exchanges coming in. So let's talk about what those exchanges are and what the signs of them will be given that we're in the system. So guys, first of all, we've got work. On the left, we've got work. Then on the right, we're gonna go heat. Now let's talk about an important idea. We're going to start in the upper left-hand corner with work, and let's see if you understand the first law of thermodynamics. So guys, we've got a system, and that system does work on the surroundings. Do you see the idea of the arrows out? So the system does work on the surroundings. What happens to the amount of energy in the system if the system does work on the surroundings? It goes down. So what will the sign of that be? It will be negative. So if the system does work on the surroundings, we call that a negative energy change. Now guys, think about this. How much does the energy of the surroundings go up? The same amount that the energy of the system goes down, says who? the first law of thermodynamics. Guys, energy is not lost. So when the system does work on the surroundings, guys, what that means is, is the system loses energy, so we're gonna call it negative. The surroundings gain energy. Here's the difference. If you were in physics class, we would call this positive. Why would we call it positive? Because your frame of reference is in the surroundings, and if your frame of reference is in the surroundings, then the energy went up. But our frame of reference is always in the system, so that will be negative. So we're always looking at the energy of the system. Now, guys, let's be clear about this in case you don't understand this. How, and you guys understand that our systems are going to be chemical reactions, right? Because this is a chemistry class. How does a system, how does a chemical reaction do work on its surroundings? Remember, work is force times distance. Guys, how do chemical reactions do work? They, they expand. Guys, that's how chemical reactions do work. They do work through expansion. But guys, it's not just enough to do expansion. Expansion is the distance, right? What is the other thing that has to be present for work to be done? A resistant force, not necessarily gravity, but something in the surroundings has to be offering resistance that that expanding reaction is pushing against. So Becca, you know, sort of said, what about when, you know, something blowing up? So if you blow up a firecracker, that is certainly a chemical reaction. Is it doing work? Well, yeah, it's blowing stuff all over the place. Where's the resistance that would then allow work to be done? the air that it's pushing against, and initially the wrapper that ties the firecracker together. But once that fails, it's just things expanding against the air that doesn't want to allow it to expand, and that's where work's done. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. So guys, now let's look at the other one. So what about this guy? If the surroundings are doing work on the system, what's it gonna be? It's gonna be positive. Okay, so now let's talk heat. If the surroundings heat the system, that will be what change? Positive. Energy is going in. And then conversely, if the system is heating the surroundings, energy is going out. Okay, so guys, let's pause. Let's make sure you're clear on this. So here's what we know. We know that when we measure the energy of a system, we are going to talk about changes of energy and we are going to measure changes in energy by looking at the, the lens, the avenue of heat and work. And we understand that work requires force against a distance. It's not enough to just travel a distance. There has to be a resisting force that you're pushing against. And then we understand that heat is an exchange of energy due to temperature gradients. And those are the two ways to get energy in and out. What do we need to talk about? Because we're about to undo all of this. But guys, not in a bad way, it's a good way, but it all depends upon you understanding this. You guys good? You're sure? 
Go ahead. Oh, you're just stretching. You guys good? All right. Here we go, gang. Do you remember when you first read this word? When you were going through chapter five and you kind of had this idea that Knappenberger was definitely going to earn his salary trying to teach me this? Uh huh. Yeah. So guys, what is enthalpy? In order to understand enthalpy, you've, and you said you were good, you understand that the only way to get energy in and out of a system is work and heat, right? Heat is due to temperature and temperature differences. Work is force over a distance. Okay, here we go. What is enthalpy? In order for us to talk about enthalpy, it requires a simplification. In the same way that to talk about ideal gases requires a simplification. Two, actually. But enthalpy's only got one. Guys, in order for us to talk about enthalpy, we will assume that all chemical reactions take place in what are called open containers. And guys, let me just tell you right now, the term open container is an accepted term. You can use it on the AP test. It's not our little nickname for these. Open container is an accepted term. But the technical term for an open container is a constant pressure container. Bless you. Okay. So guys, let's make sure you're not muddled right now. Do you remember when we talked about closed systems last time? What is a closed system? What can get in and out? Heat and work, energy. But what can't get in and out? Matter. Okay. So guys, this does not contradict the other. So now what we're going to say is this. Think through this with me. All of the chemical reactions that we're going to talk about in this class will happen in closed systems that are open containers. What does it mean that it's a closed system? Mass is conserved. Energy gets in and out. Matter can't. Now, what does it mean that it's an open container? And guys, I want to define for you what an open container is right now. You want to write this down. An open container is a hypothetical container that offers no resistance. I would underline the word resistance like 11 times. Offers no resistance to expansion or contraction. That's it. Okay. So guys, here's the magic moment. Are you guys all caught up with me? You're okay? You're good? Okay. So write down this equation with me. Delta E is equal to Q, which is what? Heat plus W, which is work. Okay. So we are now talking about delta E, which is the energy of a system that's going to be a chemical reaction. Doesn't matter what it is. We're just talking hypothetical. Now, here's the deal. There's only two ways that the energy of that reaction can change, work and heat. But guys, now remind yourselves what two things have got to be there for work to be done. Force a, can we say a resistant force? And we've got to have a distance traveled. So it's not enough just for something to expand. That's not enough for work to be done. There also has to be a resistance to that expansion that then requires work to be done to overcome it. Now, Let's carry out a reaction in an open container. 
And guys, imagine this is, this is what I do. This is my mental picture. Imagine a balloon. And inside that balloon, you're going to do all of your chemical reactions. But this balloon is not just a stupid sheet of latex. This balloon has mystical, magical powers that allow it to see into the future. And this balloon knows what's going on inside of itself. And it's saying to itself, the reaction that's going on inside of me is going to get bigger. And I am going to magically expand at exactly the right rate so that I'm keeping in step with the reaction as it expands. And then the same magic balloon can go, wait, there's a reaction going on inside of me that can get smaller, and I'm going to magically contract at exactly the right rate so that I'm contracting right along with the reaction, and I am not offering resistance to expansion or contraction. I just magically get out of the way no matter what I need to do so that there's no resistance to expansion and contraction. You get the idea? Do these really exist? But it's good for us. And here's why. Guys, if we're inside this magic balloon that we call an open container, what happens to the resistant force? It goes away. And if the resistant force goes away, what also goes away? Work. The ability for reactions to do work. And so if we get rid of the ability to do work, then what's the only way left to get energy in and out of a system? Heat. And heat, in the absence of work, is called enthalpy. That was worth the price of admission. Guys, that's all that enthalpy is. We'll define it in a second. But let's make sure you're clear on this idea. Oh, do you guys know about the three dots? Therefore, good. Feel free to use that on the AP test. What's that? Hold on a second. So guys, the three dots, so therefore, so the idea is this. Therefore, no work can be exchanged between the system and the surroundings. So what's the therefore about? Well, the therefore is about the open container. This offers no resistance. Therefore, no work can be done. And this then leads us to the idea of enthalpy because enthalpy is heat exchange in the absence of the potential for work. And that'll come up in the next slide. Go ahead. So what's our margin of error when you're talking about the heat? Like, like yeah, so, and that, so. Uh, yes, but also, so it's a good question. So how big of an overassumption is this? And the answer is, if you're talking about explosives, <laughs> a lot, because that's kind of what they do, although they create a lot of heat as well. Um, but the trick is, what about reactions that don't form gases? If you have reactions that don't form gases, typically they can't do work because they can't expand. And in that case, open containers are wonderful approximations because they can't do work anyway. So the place where we really need to be careful about whether it's okay to talk about open containers is in gas forming reactions. And then you can talk about them or not, depending upon, you know, if, if you're working out here at the mouth of Spanish Fort Canyon, working at that dynamite plant, you're not going to be thinking about open containers. But if you're working in a solubility lab up at the U, it's just fine. So it depends on your context. So, but understand that even down at the, even down at the labs, you know, where they're building dynamite, they'll still talk about enthalpy because then what it allows them to do is it allows them to think about the heat that's exchanged and then they can have a separate conversation about the work that's done. So it allows them to divide the two. So you guys good? All right. So guys, let's put it in writing, shall we? Goes like this. This is it. Guys, enthalpy is heat in the absence of work. For some of you, this is sort of an apt description of your life. 
I'm warm, I just don't do anything. <laughs> Never mind. Sorry. I know. Uh, so guys, how do we accomplish this? Let's put a very fine point on it. How is it that we can talk about heat in the absence of work? What has to be gone? Which part of work? Resistance. Resistance. And guys, we sort of skirted around this. We understand that an open container is really called what? Constant pressure container. So does that make sense that if you've got a if you've got a balloon and if you carry out a reaction that releases a bunch of gas, the balloon will expand, but you'll experience an increase in pressure because the balloon is actually squeezing on the reaction. So when we say a constant pressure vessel, what that means is, is a balloon that magically expands and contracts just in step with the reaction, our magic balloon. But guys, the way we say all of that is that enthalpy is heat exchanged under constant pressure. So what's the connection? Constant pressure means no resistant force. No resistant force means no work. No work means heat exchanged in the absence of work, and that's enthalpy. Yeah? Times distance. No, and that was sort of the Jake's other example. Reactions that don't create gases don't do distance. They don't expand, right? If you have a chemical reaction where you're just forming precipitates, you don't have an expansion and contraction. So there could be resistance. If there's no distance, you still don't have work. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's really gas form. You know, his question was, when does this really become important and how big of an overassumption is it? And the answer is, depends on if it's making a gas. If you've got a reaction that's making a gas, then you really should be talking about work. Um, and guys, maybe I could mention this to you if you'd like. If you'd like a little deeper dive on this idea of work, um, go to page one. We're not going to do this now, but if you'd like, if you go to page 172, the book actually does a nice job in this. You guys all, of course, skip these, right? The closer look, which immediately tells you not important. It's extra stuff, right? Okay. So guys, if you'd like to read that closer work, it does a fairly nice, succinct job of explaining how reactions do work by changing pressure and volume. It's called PV work. And you can read that if you'd like. Okay. So guys, you ready? Coming back to what you need to understand. You're not gonna like this. So guys, here's where we're at. We've got change in energy is Q plus W. We've now gotten rid of W, so what does that leave us with? Q, which is heat. And heat, in the absence of work, is called enthalpy. But guys, it turns out that we don't say enthalpy and abbreviate it Q. There's a different abbreviation for enthalpy and it's H. So you ready? Heat is abbreviated Q and enthalpy is abbreviated H. I know. Now guys, here's the thing. And you're going to hear me make this mistake. It's, it's bordering on not even a mistake. So we will always use, oh sorry. We will always use enthalpy We will always use H to represent enthalpy. Next time, we're going to start talking about, well, even today, we're going to start talking about delta H, which is what? Change in enthalpy. But guys, you will hear me many times just call this change in heat. And I would suspect that there are even college professors that would let you get away with that because while it's not technically a change in heat, because enthalpy and heat are not the same things, enthalpy is heat in the absence of work, so many times they're so closely related that I, if you were to call this, if you're writing out a sentence on an AP test, call this change in enthalpy. 
But don't be surprised if like in lab, we're going to do two labs on this starting next week. Don't be surprised, guys, if I just sort of called just, hey, change in heat. It's really change in enthalpy. But yeah, you'll see. Okay, so now, guys, let's talk about these changes. So just like measuring changes in enthalpy is final minus, or I'm sorry, measuring changes in energy is final minus initial, so is changes in enthalpy final minus initial. Now we're ready to bring this full circle and come back to the question that we answered in number three. Remember when Brandon asked about that question and we had this picture and we had products and we had reactants and we said energy was going up? Do you remember that? And do you remember what it said in question number three C? It said, if work can't be done, you remember that? What were they setting you up for? Enthalpy. They ask you in part C, what if work can't be done? And we just said, we just took it for granted. But now you understand what question C was really about was about enthalpy. And it said, if work can't be done, is this endo or exothermic? And which one was it? endothermic because energy is going in. And now guys, we can bring that full circle and we can say this positive delta H values are endothermic. And similarly, negative delta H values are exothermic. You were able to figure that out as we graded homework today in 3C, but now you have so much more rich in understanding of why and what that actually means to think about heat in the absence of work. which means now I'm going to make notes to myself and in future years, I'm going to make sure we talk about 3C and grading homework, even if my students don't want to. Go ahead. No, no, light a match. Stick your hand over it. You'll quickly understand exothermic. You guys good? All right. So guys, here we go. We are now going to start quantifying this idea of enthalpy. We're going to talk about some numbers today. On Friday, we're going to talk about where these numbers come from. But guys, as we start talking about enthalpy as it applies to chemical reactions, Don't write this down, but let me contextualize this for you. Delta H is equal to, you guys already wrote this down, the, didn't you, in the previous? Okay, so H final minus H initial. But this works for any system. This could be balls flying through the air. This works for anything. So now let's make this specific to a chemistry class. Guys, what do we call the final stuff in a chemical reaction? The products. And the initial stuff, of course, is the reactants. So when we cast this equation in a chemistry class, it becomes this. This is the same as final minus initial. It's just the final stuff is the products and the initial stuff is the reactants. Okay, so guys, with that said then, we are now going to talk about what are called thermochemical equations. So let's break this down. Thermo is heat. Chemical equations, you guys know how to write and balance them. You know they're single, double displacement, synthesis, decomposition, combustion, all of that good stuff. So guys, basically what we're talking about now is we're going to take chemical equations, which you've known about for a year, well, more than a year, and now we're going to talk about the thermo of them. The amount of energy that's being given off or taken in as these reactions take place. So let me show you an example of one and you're going to want to scribble it down. So 2H2 plus O2 yields 2H2O. Gosh, that's familiar. That's the synthesis reaction that forms water from its elemental components. But now we got a delta H. 
And now we understand that delta H means enthalpy, the amount of heat in the absence of work that is exchanged when this takes place. And we've got a number, negative 483.6 kilojoules. No, because it's not just expansion, it's contraction. But if something, can, if something contracts, then the system isn't doing work. The system is having work done upon it. So we have to make that assumption in either direction. Yep. That's correct. Absolutely. Yep. So guys, let's talk about what on earth this means. And I would encourage you to sort of pick this apart with me and make sure you're clear on this. So gang, I would suggest that this is really familiar, right? It's a synthesis reaction. It's balanced. You're, this, is, this is an old friend. But now we've got a new member of the family and it's this. And let's talk about what this means. So guys, first of all, Tell me what that negative sign means to you. The reaction is exothermic. Now guys, don't say that flippantly without really understanding it. So in order for this to mean that this process is exothermic, the first thing we've got to do is identify our system. Ready? What's our system? These atoms and these atoms and these molecules. Guys, that's your system. In this class, nine times out of 10, your system is going to be the atoms that make up the reactants and the products. Okay, so now, if, this, if these are our system, why is it that negative means exothermic? Where does that put you? in the system. Mentally, conceptually, you are now this little observer that's hanging out with hydrogen and oxygen atoms and water molecules. And as you see them react together as hydrogen and oxygen makes water, energy is going out. It's going out into the environment, out into the surroundings, and we are losing energy. And we know that again because this is negative. But you'll notice that it's not just negative, it's also got this unit's kilojoules. Guys, this is a lot of energy. So here's the question. First of all, what does this reaction look like? It looks like the Hindenburg blimp killing a bunch of Germans about 70 years ago. Guys, that's this reaction. Back before they knew better, they filled these, these lighter than air crafts, they filled them with hydrogen. And all it took was a spark and that reaction starts and all that hydrogen reacts with the oxygen in the air and you get water and a whole lot of dead people. So guys, this, if you can picture, you've seen video of the Hindenburg going up in flames. Guys, that's this very exothermic reaction. So when the Hindenburg went up in flames, does that mean that 483 kilojoules of energy was released? Why not? Was it more or less? A whole lot more. Why was it a whole lot more? Because, yeah, because guys, this is only two moles of hydrogen. How much is two moles of hydrogen? Well, what's one mole of hydrogen? 22.4 liters, double that. So it's about 50 liters. Guys, that's how much energy is released when 50 liters of hydrogen goes up. We're talking about multiple orders of magnitude more than that. So it was a lot more energy because there was a lot more hydrogen. So guys, how then do we read these? Well, we know that 483.6 kilojoules of energy are released when two moles of hydrogen react with one mole of oxygen to make two moles of water. What if this was four, two, and four? How much energy? Twice as much. Do you get the idea? Go ahead. Divide by half a Godro's number. Yeah, yeah, let's not do that. But yeah, yeah, that's all you'd have to do. Let's divide by half a Godro's number. You guys okay with that idea? Yeah, so what about this then? 
Are you, you're, you're all, are you, okay, so what about this? So what kind of reaction is this? Synthesis. What is it now? Decomposition. Do you remember that they're inverses of each other? So guys, you want to take any guesses on what the delta H is for this? Positive 483.6. So guys, these also work in both directions. If you know the energy associated with the process, and if you flip that process over, the sign of the energy flips, but the number doesn't change. Do you get the idea? Okay, so guys, let me summarize all those thoughts for you. Write down what you feel you need to. Thought number one is this, enthalpy is an extensive property. What that means is the more matter you have, the more energy is exchanged. So guys, heats of reaction, these delta H values, are given as moles of reactants and products as represented. Second, these are reversible. So if you flip the reaction over, the sign changes. Then guys, finally, enthalpy changes are phase dependent. Steam has more energy than liquid water. So if we were to come along and change this to water, water gas instead of water liquid, the energy of the reaction would change because gas, steam, has more energy than liquid water. So there you have it. Enthalpy changes are reversible. They are for the amounts as the reaction is balanced and written. And then finally, they're phase dependent. And some phases are more so universally, liquids have more energy than solids and gases have more energy than liquids. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So for the example of their yep. the steam, yeah. the delta H would be more um, Correct. That's right. You guys good? You feeling good about this? All right. So guys, what are we going to do with this today? And obviously, a lot of what you're going to be doing in homework will be conceptual in nature because we talked about some pretty meaty concepts. But guys, we're also going to do some math. And we're going to solve this together. Here's what it says. It says, if you have 4.5 grams of methane, methane is the gas that comes out of our Bunsen burner taps. If you guys burn four and a half grams of methane, how much energy will be released? Because in order to answer this, what do we need to know? What do we need? Well, we need one of these. We need a thermochemical equation. Luckily, we happen to have one. Uh, sometimes. Uh, let me say that differently. Today, starting Friday, you're going to come up with them on your own. You know what? Well, that could be sort of an interesting, interesting way to end the day. And then we're going to have an interesting conversation to tee up the ball for Friday. Okay, okay. So, so to solve this problem, here's what we know. For every mole of methane that burns oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, combustion reaction, for every mole of methane that burns, 890 kilojoules of energy are given off. How do I know it's given off? Sign is negative. So, if we have 4.5 grams of methane burning, how much energy will that give off? Well, we don't know. What could we do to figure it out? What do we really need to know instead of the mass of the methane? 
how many moles? So guys, this is what this looks like. We're going to go 4.50 grams of methane. The question that we want to answer is how many kilojoules of energy is released? Okay, so we're going to convert to moles. So 16.0 grams is one mole of CH4. Well, I know carbon's 12 and hydrogen's 1. Don't need it because I've only got three sig figs there. So then, guys, now we can go to energy because we know for every one mole of energy, or I'm sorry, for every one mole of CH4, that is combusted, how much energy is released? Okay, 890 kilojoules. So now guys, let's talk about that negative. This is an important conversation for you to engage in. Do we need to put the negative? And the answer is, it's up to you. Okay, so when would, how does that thinking go? Well, guys, we know for every mole of, of CH4 that is reacted, 890 kilojoules of energy is going to move. The negative tells us that it's going to go out. But guys, look at the way the question is written. How much energy is released? What does the word released mean? means given off, right? So the direction is implied in the question. See what I'm saying? It's like if I'm getting ready for cycling season and if I'm trying to drop weight and if you came up to me and said, gosh, you're clearly, you know, how much weight are you losing? I wouldn't turn to you and say, I've lost negative 10 pounds. Right, because when, right, because when you came and said, how much have you lost, you're determining, you are suggesting direction, you're simply asking me to give you magnitude. So guys, the word released determines direction. If the question is said, how much energy is exchanged, then direction is not implied and the negative is necessary. Do you see the difference? Or actually, it could read like this. What is delta H if 4.5 grams of methane is burned? Then you've got to have the negative. But because the question is just saying, is saying released, it implies direction. So we go 4.5, divide that by 16, multiply that by 890, uh, two significant digits, so 250 kilojoules. Been waiting for this day. <laughs> My snatums. Okay, hey guys, you okay on the math? Yeah. Okay, we're not done. Well, we're done with the notes, but this just occurred to me. We're now going to talk about, really briefly, everything that we're going to talk about on Friday. You ready? When CH4 burns, does it give off energy or does it take in energy? gives off energy. Where on stinking earth does that energy come from? Okay, so it has something to do with bonds, right? Keep going. Guys, do you, did you hear what he said? When bonds break, it releases energy. Did you hear that? You heard that? Who did you learn that from? Me, right? We talk, Hold on, don't start putting stuff away. Guys, here's the deal. When bonds break, 
it releases energy. Energy is stored in bonds, right? No. No. I chose to not explain this to you two days ago because let's talk. Guys, when bonds break, energy is not released. It's exactly the opposite. When bonds break, energy is absorbed. So this whole idea that energy is stored in bonds and breaking bonds releases energy is complete malarkey. It is not. So remember in biology when you learned about ATP and they said ATP is the, is the currency of energy and breaking and they even showed the bonds breaking. There's a little yellow flash like energy is being given off because that's a load of crap guys, energy is not released when bonds break. Think about it. Here I've got two oxygen atoms bonded together. And if I want to break them apart, what do I have to do? I've got to add energy literally to break them apart. Guys, it's exactly the opposite. Energy is not released when, ener when bonds break. Energy is absorbed when bonds break. So now let's have the conversation. Where on earth does all of this energy come from? The new bonds forming. Guys, it is not the breaking of the bonds in the methane. It is not the breaking of the bonds in the oxygen. It's the formation of these bonds. Energy always goes in to break them and it is released when they formed. So guys, this is actually how the chemistry goes. So here we've got CH4 and we've got two O2s, like so. So in order for the CH4 and the O2s to turn into carbon dioxide and water, what has to happen? These have got to break apart. We've got to break these apart. We've got to break these apart. And we've got to break all of these apart. And that takes energy. You've got to add energy to break those apart. Now that they're all broken apart, now they turn into water. And when they do, what happens? Energy is released. And they make two, there we go, they make two waters, and I don't know if this will stick together, and then they make, this is really not bent, I don't know what to do about that, but they make carbon dioxide, and it's when they come together to form the products that energy is released. So guys, the idea is that energy goes in to break this apart, and energy comes out to form these. Now guess what? How much energy went in here? 890 kilojoules less than came out here. You get it? Okay, so the idea is this. Energy goes in to break these bonds. Energy comes out when these bonds are broken. And the amount of energy that's released, I said that wrong, energy comes out when these bonds are formed. So guys, energy in, that breaks. Energy out as this forms. And we know that the difference between those two amounts is 890 kilojoules. So energy in, energy out, the net difference is how much more out than in. Now, what if we have a reaction that takes in energy overall? More in than out. But guys, that's where these numbers, that's where this energy actually comes from, is the releasing of energy as the bonds are formed, as products are made. So does that, uh, what could I say? Does that, does that invalidate what we learned about stored energy? It doesn't, and here's why. Stored energy is potential energy, right? And I allowed you to have the misconception that potential, that, that potential energy was stored in bonds. And that's not directly the case. Breaking this bond does not release energy. But once the bond is broken, what does it now have the potential to do? 
form other bonds, and it's the formation of those bonds that actually allow for the energy to be released as potential energy. So it doesn't contradict what you learned. We still think of energy as being stored in bonds, but it's not the bonds that exist, it's the bonds that have the potential of forming when they react with other substances. Yeah. Hold that thought for, are we okay with what we just said? Because this is a completely different answer. So, don't give him a hug. <laughs> Go ahead. How about if we make a sentence that says, the breaking of bonds creates a scenario where new bonds with potential energy can be formed and release that energy? Is that okay? Is that all right? What's that? So the, it's still an energy. Let's do the, so that's a wonderful question. It's still an energy of attraction, but it's not the attraction of the atoms that are in the reactants. It's the future attraction between the atoms that will then be the products. So you can't have reactants without products, but think about it this way. We can still say that water has potential energy, but the amount, of the amount of potential energy that water possesses is not always the same. It depends on what product it turns into. So to really determine the amount of potential energy that's available, we need to know what the products are because different products will, will release different amounts of energy. Is that okay? Crazy, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Right after all the bonds that's split. Yeah, and there's a name for that. So Mark is saying, what if you were able to pause this right here? And that is actually called the apex of the reaction pathway where everything is separated. So that's where there'd be a lot of really that'd be really like it just released a bunch of energy. It had just absorbed a lot of energy. Yes, and now it's in a position where it can release energy as bonds form. Go ahead, Trace. Well, that's an interesting question. Tracy said, is there any time when they just stop right here and then they don't bond? And the answer would be yes, but then we would think of it as a reaction that we call a decomposition reaction, where the reactants just fall apart and make products. The thing that's interesting is that decomposition reactions are always endothermic because there's no bonds being formed, so there's no release of energy, so the only thing it could be is endothermic. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah. What do you think, y'all? Can we talk about Ammon's question? Okay, so guys, this is, this is free. This, this isn't part of the curriculum. So Ammon said, what about strong and weak nuclear force, right? And so we talked last year in general chemistry about the idea that breaking the strong nuclear force releases energy. That's also a lie. Um, breaking the strong nuclear force takes a pant load of energy. Like in order to set off a nuclear bomb, it takes explosives on the order of holy stinking smokes, right? As a matter of fact, hydrogen bombs, which are our most, ex most powerful nuclear weapons, a hydrogen bomb, in order to get it to detonate, requires a uranium bomb to set off the hydrogen bomb. It takes a lot of energy to get these things going. So what about all the energy that's released? Guys, make, uh, you know what, maybe we should know this for the AP curriculum. So understand, just a second, understand that when we talk about nuclear processes, it's not about the reformation of molecules that release energy. Where does the energy come from in nuclear explosions? Well, when you break that strong nuclear force, Einstein kicks in, E equals MC squared, and matter is converted to energy that wasn't there initially. So as mass is converted to energy, that's the energy of a nuclear bomb. Yeah, so that's, it's a whole different chemistry. So guys, I did not have the time to print pride reports. So it looks like you guys are, oh, hold on, I'm recording. Like you guys should wait until I have a minute 
to print the report so that I can... Okay, I'll just stop recording.